Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to episode number 62 webinar number 5 replay with Nadira and Nepal and myself where we talk about suing for the Muslim women in Africa today's episode we also had Arabic at the very end since Nepal and I speak Arabic I thought it would be really interesting to bring in swimming for Arab moms in the Middle Eastern as well. And so if you're not part of the Facebook community group, I would like to invite you to be part of the Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola, where we are helping each other stay active, be active, and move forward as a community. If you have any questions, let me know at befitforakhir at gmail.com. You can also follow on social media at Befits for Akhira. Thank you for tuning into the show and let us know what you think. In the meantime, enjoy it. I will see you on the other side. Welcome to the Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola, where I dive in deeper into holistic health and fitness topics that would help you stay inspired, motivated, and dedicated to living a purposeful fit life while pursuing for the Akhira. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Thank you for attending our fifth webinar, webinar that's part of our campaign Swim for Akhira. We are very excited to have today two swim instructors from Africa as we will talk about the struggle of swimming for the Muslim Women in Africa, presented to you by Ola, Nadira, and Nepal. And so, again, my name is Ola. I'm the founder of Bifit for Akhira. I, got, I graduated from Mason with a BS in Biology Health Promotion minor. I am an ACE certified personal trainer, swim instructor, and a podcast host of Purposeful Fitness with Coach Ola Show. Our guest for today is Nadira, and I'm going to have her introduce herself. Uh, Nadira, would you please introduce yourself to our audience? Okay, so I am Nadira Mukadam. I am from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, I've been a swimmer practically my whole life. Um, and it's been nine years now that I'm coaching swimming. Um, I've always had a passion for swimming. And I suppose because I, I, I studied BSc Sports and Exercise Science, I felt that going into the aquatic field was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, and yeah, and I own my own swimming school. Um, I teach swimming, I do baby classes, kids classes, I do special needs, I do water rehabilitation, aqua aerobics, and I, ha- I specialize in the Muslim women swimming as well. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. Thank you. And our second guest, our speaker for today is Nepal Saeed Hassan, Gavir Misbah, <laughs> nice name. Um, would you please introduce yourself to our audience? Okay. Hi. How are you, everyone? I'm Nital Saeed Mizbah. I'm from Egypt, uh, Alexandria, actually. Um, I'm a swimmer since I was um, two years old. Um, I'm really, I love uh, swimming um, very much. Um, and I'm now uh, a swimming coach. Uh, for adult and uh, crossfitter, um, and um, I just uh, I have um, I can do actually aqua therapy, um, and um, I hope that uh, we can make everyone and uh, anyone just if you if you if any girl wanted to swim around the world, uh, uh, she can swim and she. Uh, can do whatever she can do um, and I hope every girl in the world uh, can swim and, uh, and just be a competitor um, that's what I actually hope yay thank you so much so our objectives for today's webinar is to have an open Q&A with Nadira as well as with Nepal in both English and Arabic since you both speak are the same language Mm-hmm. And then she'll discuss a little bit of the future of swimming in Africa from their perspective. And then any Q&As from, from our audience. And so we will start with Nadira. She is from South Africa. I forgot that I don't want to say the wrong name. So would you please remind us the exact location, if you don't mind? 
Um, Cape Town, South Africa. Cape Town, South Africa. Okay, thank you. And so would you please share a little bit in depth, uh, how did you start your swimming journey? Um, so I started when I was really little. Um, the earliest memory I have of swimming was my, when my uncle threw me in the water and told me to swim <laughs> to the other end. Um, and I did it, I suppose. And I, I wasn't as scarred as, as most people might be. Um, and then when I was young, I was about seven years old, we moved to Singapore, um, my parents and I and my brother. And my mom insisted that I do swimming lessons and I really enjoyed it. So I did my swimming lessons there. And then when I came back to South Africa, I started swimming professionally. So I swam for a club and then I swam for school as well. And then I got into water polo and it was a bit more competitive and a bit more fun. So I got into that as well. So as far as I can remember, I was always swimming. <laughs> That's all, yeah. yeah. And how old were you when, when you were thrown? <laughs> Ooh, I think I must have been four or five, I think. That's all. <laughs> I was really small. I need to just ask my uncle again, but yeah, I was really young. I think um, it's like a lot of stories, like, you know, especially from like a lot of kids, like, oh, I was just thrown. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So there's some um, some people who get thrown into the water quite often and they actually stay, they, they have a fear of water after that. Um, and I've got an assistant coach who had that happen to her when she was younger and for most of her life she was actually scared of water. And then um, she came for swimming at Freckles Aquatic. She learned to swim and she loved it so much that she actually became a coach. So, yeah. Awesome, yeah. And so, how did uh, Frel? How do you pronounce your pre- Frelix? Freckles. Freckles. I've got a whole lot of freckles on my face. You know what I mean? <laughs> I've got a whole. Hug? That was just always my nickname. So I think everyone just knows freckles is Najida. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. love it. How did it all start out um, for you? Um, freckles Aquatics. Yes. Okay, so we have a pool at the back of our home. Uh, my mom had it bolt, or my parents had it bolt when I was a, a lot younger. Um, it was indoor, it's heated, and I suppose it was just an ideal space to teach. So um, I started off with a couple of my aunts, actually, my dad's sisters. They needed to get into the water, they wanted to learn to swim. I was literally still studying, I think I was in first year or something like that. Um, I was studying and I kind of had a lot of fun teaching them how to swim. So I kind of taught them how to blow bubbles and how to move and how to swim. And they really enjoyed it. And thereafter, I, I, I found out that I really enjoyed it. So um, I, I made my own little flyers. I printed it. And I went to the park around the corner from our house. And I went to go hand out flyers. I wasn't sure if people would be interested because, I mean, I, I was kind of new to it. And I started off with, I think, three clients. That was in 2011. Just three little kids teaching them how to swim. And I suppose from there, it just grew. So, yeah. That's so cool, mashallah. And in your experience as a swim instructor in Africa, what problems and struggles have you noticed, especially with Muslim women and with swimming? So I've noticed that a lot of Muslim women within, I would, sp- I would speak about Cape Town specifically, um, they don't really feel comfortable to be in a pool with a male. Um, I suppose, yes, they wear their, their burkinis and their long swimming suits and stuff like that. But in the water, it kind of sticks to your body. And I think that the women don't necessarily feel comfortable with being in the same space in the water with men. Um, and I suppose that's what really helped make my business grow because when I started swimming and started teaching, because I'm in the water with my clients, I never actually taught men. I only taught women. Um, and I think from that, the, the women kind of felt really comfortable because it was a, it, it, it's an environment where it's enclosed. So there's, even if my dad and my brother come home, they can't see what's happening in the pool kind of a thing. And also... Um, yeah, and there's no males within the facility during that time. Um, and I, I think that was one of, the, one of the issues. The second issue was that um, a lot of women have fear, Muslim women have fear of water. Um, and I noticed that in my business, whereby majority of the women that come for swimming have probably never swam. And m- m- most of them are, are mature. So they're not like 16 or 17. They're kind of 
40, 50, 60, 70 years old, but they've had a lot of fear of water within their childhood and they've never actually attended swimming lessons. So um, I noticed that, that with, the, with the more mature women, there was a lot of fear about the water. One of the reasons was because they were thrown into the water. The second was because they maybe had a really bad experience around water, whether they've almost drowned or they kind of slipped and they fell or something like that. So those are the two main concerns that I had. Um, and I can say that with studying sports science and doing a bit of sports psychology, um, I've managed to kind of get around the fear and get them to be more comfortable in the water. I myself, for one, have never really had a fear for water, whereas my assistant coach has. So my clients can, she and my clients can kind of relate where she will say, you know what, I've had this fear and I know what it feels like. And they kind of have confidence in themselves because she's gotten to a point where she can swim all four strokes, she can do tumble turns, she can dive in, she can swim underwater. And this is from learning in the past maybe five or six years, not actually from when she was younger like me. So yeah, those are the main concerns that I think uh, are, are happening in Cape Town, South Africa at the moment. Yes, and it's very common like all over the world, uh, unfortunately for like our women. Uh, but like it's good you brought this up as well. Um, and so how can we support Muslim women in Africa, get more access to swimming and learn more about it? Like I'm from all over the USA, but how can I support you from way back here, for instance? <laughs> it's a tough well, question. I think it, it's not only something, it's not only something that we've got to focus um, within Cape Town, South Africa, but more with around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, my facility caters for women only classes and men only classes. So my brother's a swim coach as well. He coaches the men and the elder boys that don't feel comfortable with me being their coach. Um, and I, I coach the women um, and the girls and the kids, for example. Um, another thing that I've noticed was a lot of the parents that have um, asked about swimming lessons for their children, the first question was that they asked was, is there a female coach? And I'm, I'm not sure what the whole thing is. Obviously, there are male coaches, there's female coaches. You, you've kind of got to do whatever you need to do. But I've noticed that a lot of the, the mothers that message me are more comfortable with having a female coach for their children, whether it be their son or their daughter, doesn't really make a difference. Um, but I think just generally making women feel comfortable in the pool, I think that is like the most important thing. So if you're going to have a class and you've got 10 ladies that you're going to teach, try and teach them in a class where they will feel comfortable. So whether it's a huge pool and the men are in the second lane and they in the first lane, just for example, where they might feel a bit more comfortable, I think that's really important. And the last thing that I wanted to add with regards to fear is that everyone has fear in their lives. Everyone has some sort of fear. But it's not really about saying, you know what, just get over the fear. Or if you're scared of heights, just climb the mountain and you'll get over it. It's not as easy as that. But rather being compassionate and, and empathetic, sympathetic towards them in helping them overcome the fear. Because the fear of water can potentially affect um, someone by they can drown. They might have a fear so they can't really learn to swim. They're not willing to learn to swim and they can drown all of the bed. But I mean, there's things like this that can happen. And I think it's really, really important to, to open that awareness around water and safety, water safety. Awesome. Yeah, I love that. So water safety is something we can all do. Uh, and also the confidence so we can be the role models. Thank you so much. We will have more time yes. for her to um, an answer questions. So cool. yes, and now we go to our um, instructor in Egypt, North Africa. So we go up to North Africa right now and talk with um, Nibha. Would you please share with us again, how did you start with your swing journey? I know it was like two years old, mashallah, but like how? That's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, my family just, um, they are swimmers, actually. Uh, so, you know, when your, uh, your father or your mother are just swimmer, so, uh, okay, my daughter, we're going to be swimming. Uh, that's it. 
So I just um, I um, I swam when I was two when I was uh, three years old, and then um, I just um, being a swimmer because I feel like I'm really very comfortable when I swim. Uh, I getting uh, um, I just get older and I feel like um, I couldn't um, be more happier. Um, in when I just be in the in the pool or in the water actually actually in the sea or a pool or whatever in uh, then when I just be and when I'm just um, 16 years old uh, I feel like um, oh my gosh I'm a really a swimmer and I, I love to be a coach uh, and I wanted to be a coach like my coaching uh, I just wanted to um, to uh, to make people more happy and know more, more about uh, how to make people a swimmer and a good swimmer and etc. Uh, so um, uh, when I just be uh, in 21 years old, um, I feel like uh, I wanted to be a swimmer coach and uh, I wanted to uh, coach uh, all type of people not just Muslims, but all uh, the people. I wanted to um, to make everyone know how to swim. Uh, just and because I feel like uh, when anyone just swim, they just being relaxed and being just happy. I I, I don't know. If, if this is for me. I just I'm really very happy when I see water. Actually, <laughs> this is for me. <laughs> I don't know what about people, but. For me, I just love to see uh, to see uh, the pool and water, or whatever. Uh, so um, that's uh, that's. I just uh, I decided to make everyone happy because I wanted to see everyone smile and happy, and this is my message actually. That's it. <laughs> yes, I think every student can relate to like that feeling of being in the water. I get it. Um, yeah. So I want to ask you from you, you know. I have no idea. Is it something that is challenging for Muslim women, especially in hijab, or is it something that is more normal in the country? Because, like, in the USA, it's a bit, you know, not very normal. Normal, but not that normal. So how normal is it normal in Egypt, since there are a lot of Muslims and hijabis? Actually, Burkini, it's, it's really a very problem here in Egypt. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, for two sides. Uh, first side, Burkini for the swimmers, it's um, they feel like they are not comfortable when they are swam because uh, they feel uh, that, that they couldn't swim with burkini. Um, this is for for swimmers uh, and for the um, um, for for everyone else when they see just uh, any any girl just wear burkini, they just look at oh my gosh what she wear a burkini. Uh, this is weird. Uh, this is in the places and in another place no it's fine when you wear a burkini it's uh, it's kind of okay she wear it she can wear whatever she wanted to wear a uh, bikini burkini or whatever she wants uh, this is different uh, from uh, um, place to place like alexandria egypt uh, have a lot of alexandria um, cairo uh, tanta uh, a lot of places in um, uh, in egypt so in Tonta, it's they they feel oh my gosh what she wear. Uh, in Alexandria, okay, it's kind of um, I wear burkini or not, you know. That's not it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's interesting to like hear that from you from like you know it's in Muslim majority country as well, but it's interesting to hear that. And so in your experience as a swim instructor. In Egypt and in North Africa, you know, being other around other countries, uh, what problems and struggles have you noticed with Muslim women and with swimming? Uh, the most the problem that I saw actually um, when uh, they swam with the burkini, um, um, I feel like um, in, in the past they, they just uh, they. There is no place, private place for for girls. Right now, we make a private place for girls. Uh, they can swim uh, and wear. Uh, they are Muslims and wear hijab, and, but private place for them, uh, ladies only. Uh, but uh, I am I'm now uh, make them just have one lane for them uh, and swim 
um, with boys, uh, it's fine. And make everyone just feel like comfortable when they are swam. Uh, the problem is uh, they, they wear burkini, but they are afraid of uh, because of uh, the, the boys or uh, the men's uh, just look at them and uh, look how they are swam or um, they, the ladies is always afraid of this uh, of this look so um, I'm talking with everyone just please uh, make a space for us to can swim and to can enjoy our life because we are human we wanted to swim like you all people swim uh, we have to swim like everyone, uh, not because we are we wear burkini or we wear hijab. We couldn't swim or enjoy our life. We have to, to enjoy our life too. Um, this is uh, this is the message. Yeah, and I'm um, actually alhamdulillah in Egypt. Uh, everything's not uh, not um, everything's good with this, but in um, like um, places. Um, they couldn't wear a burkini. That's it. Uh, well, do you know anything about like other countries near Egypt, like Libya, Tunis, Tunis, um, Tunisia, Tunisia? Tunisia. Uh, in, in Libya, actually, right now in Libya, you you know, uh, this is uh, there is no uh, country actually, <laughs> and right now in Libya, no, it's 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 hard to wear a, uh, it's hard to swim actually. <laughs> not uh, in where oh, okay a burkini and it's hard to swim in Libya in Saudi Arabia um, they can swim in places just ladies only in Saudi Arabia and um, like uh, Dubai uh, they have um, uh, time uh, like uh, they just make ladies only uh, time in afternoon or in evening they have just two hours or one hour you can swim for ladies only that's it. Um, around the uh, in Libya, uh, sorry, in uh, Dubai, in um, um, Lebanon, like like Lebanon, too. Bird. Thank you. Um, and so that's a good follow up question. How can we support Muslim in Egypt and Middle East have more access? Is there a way um, besides like starting this conversation? In your opinion. Uh, in my opinion, to um, to make um, to make more swimmers uh, in uh, in Egypt or uh, or South Africa, uh, I think uh, we we just have to make them feel like comfortable. Uh, not like Najira, she said, not only uh, in the country or or something, not but also around the world. We have to make them feel just comfortable and uh, feel uh, they it's it's okay to swim whatever you want to 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 swim uh, just wear protein and just swim feel satisfied and feel just happy feel confident about yourself. Uh, I want you actually I would like to to give this message to all the uh, the girls to make feel that like they are satisfied when they are swam. It's okay to swim. It's okay to just to be a beginner and you will gonna be a great swimmer you just have to to feel confident you have to trust yourself you have to never give up never lose hope you can do whatever you want to do just have faith and have a dream um, and just do just enjoy your life because our life is just like like uh, like a second enjoy it or you will never enjoy it yes thank you so much and now we will move the same questions in arabic so anyone who is not going to understand us, um, please bear with us. But I want to be able to uh, approach women who speak Arabic as well, inshallah. So now Nepal, نفس الأسئلة بالعربي خدي راحتك شوي. So كيف كان كيف كان الحال بالنسبة لك تصبحي مدربة السباحة بمصر؟ طبعا يعني هل هو دش يمثل تحديدا النساء المسلمات خاصة بالحجاب أو إنه أمر طبيعي بالبلاد؟ آه لا هو بيبقى امر يعني هو بيبقى حاجه طب يعني مش حاجه طبيعيه برضو فيها في اماكن برضو آه بيبقى فيها ان انت يعني ان انت تعملي بوركيني مثلا او كده ان انت تلبسي بوركيني في اماكن بيبقى فيها صعبه 
بس احنا حاولنا ان احنا نكسر الحاجه ديت يعني وان هم يلبسوا البوركيني مثلا لا ان انت تحس ان انت يعني ان انت تحس ان انت ساتيسفايد يعني وكده من ان انت تلبس البوركيني يعني وكده سوري ان انا عملت ميكس لا لا احكي عادي خدي راحتك بس يعني في عندهم خوف اه بيبقى عندهم خوف ان هم يلبسوا البوركيني او هم بيبقوا يعني مش ساتيسفايد قوي ان هم يلبسوا بوركيني حوالين الولاد وكده بس انا بحاول طبعا ان انا بوصل المسج دي ليهم ان هو لا ما حدش يخاف وان عادي خالص ان احنا بنلبس بوركيني وبننزل ده حاجه ده امر طبيعي فانا دايما لازم الحاجه دي بحط لهم ان هم يبقوا مور ساتيسفايد وان هم يبقوا واثقين في نفسهم اكتر شكرا وسؤال الثاني في تجربتك كمدربة السباحة في مصر وشمال أفريقيا ما هي المشاكل والمصارعات يعني اللي تلاحظيها مع المسلمات والسباحة؟ المشاكل إن هم بيبقي أماكن كتير زي مثلا اللي هي مثلا هم مش بيبقوا عايزين ما ينفعش إن إحنا ننزل فيها المشكلة بتبقى حاجتين الحاجة الأول بتبقى عندها إن هي مش عارفة إن هي تنزل ال 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 البول بال بال بالبوركيني وإن هي برضو الحاجة برضو اللي هي بتبقى من عند ال government مثلا إن أحيانا في أماكن ممنوع فيها إن إحنا ننزل بالبوركيني بس دلوقتي ال government بقت بتحاول إن هي تساعدنا في الحاجة دي وبقوا إن هم بيسمحوا إن إحنا ننزل بالبوركيني في حاجات يعني آه، وكيف نح يمكن لنا أن دعم المساعدة في مصر والشرق الأوسط للحصول على المزيد من السباحة والمعرفة عنها أكثر؟ آه، الحاجة دي إن إحنا يا ريت إن إحنا نديهم موتيفيشن أكثر ونتكلم معاهم وإن هم لازم يحسوا بإن هم يقدروا يعملوا كل دوت وإن هم عادي يعني أنا برضو يا أولى كنت عايزاكي إن أنت تتكلمي معاهم في الحكاية دي إن ودوت ف ف يعني في العالم كله مش مش بس في في مصر مثلا او كده ان احنا ندي لهم موتيفيشن وان هو ايا كان سنك او ايا كان يور ريليجن مثلا او اي حاجه انت تقدري تعومي وتقدري تحققي حتى لو كان سنك كان كبير لا تقدري لازم نديهم موتيفيشن والحافز ان هم ان هم يعني يكملوا ان هم لا لازم يعوموا فديت الحاجه دي احنا عايزينها ان الحاجه ديت تنزل على العالم كله يعني مش جس مش بس في مصر واخر سؤال هو كان اول سؤال بس كيف بدات رحله السباحه الخاصه بك انا كان عمري سنتين انا عيلتي اساسا سباحه بس فاي حد بيبقى عيلته سباحه سباحه او كده فبينزلوا الميه فانا نزلوا الميه انا كان عمري سنتين بقيت بقيت سباحة وبقيت بحب المية قوي لدرجة ان انا ما بقتش قادرة ان انا استغنى عنها المية بقت بالنسبة لي هي كل حاجة لحد برضو ما بقى عمري 16 سنة حسيت ان انا لا ان انا ان انا اقدر ان انا ابقى ان انا اعلم السباحة وكده 21 سنة قلت لا انا لازم ابقى ابقى سويمنج كوتش وابقى زي الكوتش بتاعي وان انا برضو ادي لهم موتيفيشن وكده لحد ما بقيت بقى سويمنج كوتش وبقيت بقيت برضو ان انا بعمل لهم علاج في الميه وكده في ناس برضو بتتعمل لهم علاج جنائي وكده أه لحد ما انا عشان انا نفسي اخلي الناس كلها تبقى مبسوطه وفرحانه وبوصل لهم المسج ان انت لازم تلعب سباحه عشان هتفرق معاك في حياتك يس شكرا كثير و Thank you everyone that's been patient for us. Now we will talk about the future of swimming in Africa and it's open discussion, so you can enter yourself, um, Nazira. But Egypt is known to be the, for the blue hole and this is a famous diving spot that is more than 300 feet under the water. And so it's an open panel discussion so whoever wants to go first, feel free. But where do you see the future of swimming in Africa? Nazira, would you like to go first? Nazira, are you here? Your camera is frozen. Oh no, she's gone. Oh no. Nazira, okay, can you? Hi, And meet yourself, my friend. Oh, <laughs> yeah. All right, there you go. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, where do you see the future of swimming in Africa? 
Sorry, you're speaking to me. Sorry, I just, I just, I just missed it. Um, well, I, I think that um, there's a lot more awareness. Well, I can't really speak for Africa, but I'll speak for South Africa. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a lot more awareness about swimming right now than maybe there used to be. Um, for example, they've now made a rule in Cape Town um, that when you reach grade one, so that's when you're at school, you're about six or seven years old, um, you need to be able to, to know how to swim. Um, and I suppose it's, it's from a safety perspective as well, which is really, really great. But in that way, a lot more children, younger children are, are actually learning to swim. Um, the other thing is that there have been some hectic drownings within South Africa um, over the past couple of years. An example that I can give you is we've had water restrictions not too long ago. Um, we kind of, it wasn't really a drought, but I mean, it was, there was hectic water restrictions in place. And basically, people used to collect buckets of water outside in their backyard because now we couldn't just use tap water to water our gardens and wash our cars and stuff. So we used to collect the little rainwater into buckets. And I think it was about two years ago that a little boy, I think he was three years old, drowned in the bucket. Um, and it, it's something as simple as maybe, I mean, we, 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 we teach our, our little baby classes through song and play. So we'll teach them and we'll sing a song on how to get into the water, how to get out of the water, what to do if you fall in the water, you know, um, maybe how to float on your back. So how you swim when you turn on your back. Um, and I think that the awareness around that is a lot, a lot bigger right now. Um, there's also been a lot of drownings within the more rural areas um, within South Africa. Um, and the, 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 the more poor, uh, less fortunate communities um, struggle with swimming because, you know, a lot of the time swimming lessons are is so expensive that the less fortunate people really can't afford it. Um, and I mean, for us, for one, I've, I've always wanted to do this project, but I was just never able to do it. Um, but we started it in 2019, which was last year, where we do swimming lessons for underprivileged children. And it's basically, it's sponsored, so they don't have to pay. We pay for the transport, we pay for the swimming lessons, we pay for the, the, the bathing costumes, towels, swimming caps, everything. They get everything. And what we actually try to teach them, so... We give them a, a 10 week uh, period. And what we try to teach them is water safety and anything else. For them to know, you know, they always say like respect water and the water will respect you. Um, and I think that's really, really important. And some people just don't know what to do or they're so fearful of water. Um, and I think basically that, that's, that's what we start is just water safety, just understanding what water is, what to do around water and safe in and around water. And once the kids, well, I'm speaking about kids specifically now, once the kids know how to respect water, they know how to treat water, they know how to act around water, it will make them kind of a bit more confident to learn how to swim in water. Um, and I can, I can give you an example. There were two kids from the rural area who came to swim um, last year in, in September. And they were so scared because two of their family members had drowned in water. So they were taught to be scared of water. Um, but, so they had the fear in them already. But once they got into the water, and it wasn't so much as get into the water and swim, but it was more like, come walk with us in the water, feel how it feels to walk in the water, you can hold my hand, let's walk and let's feel, let's sit in the water, move your hands in the water, maybe turn around and kick, I'll hold you tight. They enjoyed it so much that their understanding of water changed completely and I think that's very, very important. So that's my input to, to, to the future of swimming in South Africa is just getting people to be a bit more comfortable and working with people's fears. That's a huge one. Um, and that reminds me of my conversation last weekend with Nura, where we talk about the kids and swimming. And she yes. said the same thing about yes. the parents' behaviors is really important to like let go of the fear. Yes. And the yes. obviously past experiences. And so 
what about you, Nepal? Where do you see the future of swimming in Africa, perhaps in Egypt or in entire like continent or North Africa? Um, I'm sorry, again, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I'll ask an Eric again, just in case. Where do you see the future of swimming in Africa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. uh, I, I see, um, uh, actually, I see that everyone just can, um, can swim. Um, adults and uh, small, uh, yeah, like uh, boy, sorry, um, adults and everyone just can swim. Uh, even babies in the, like uh, um, uh, like one year, they have one year. Just they, we supposed to make everyone just can swim, even the babies, because the baby when we teach them how to swim. Um, this is gonna make them uh, feel like very comfortable and they will change their life when you are uh, adults. Uh, it will change their behaviors, when it change their thoughts, change everything. I wanted to make um, Egypt just feel like uh, at South Africa, uh, just feel like they can teach every baby, not only adults, every baby, uh, even the babies, uh, newborns, they can teach them how to swim, but with a professional sw- uh, coach, not only uh, just uh, just the coach, uh, he can swim, then okay, uh, I will uh, take uh, your baby and, uh, and make them in the, in the water. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> That's, this, is not, this is not what I told actually. <laughs> I wanted to see the perfect swimming coach, uh, they teach uh, the people how to make their uh, their newborn babies uh, how to swim because this is uh, this is okay. this is very important very important to just feel like this old baby uh, can swim and feel this is not afraid of the water uh, and, and we will make a lot of people, when we will do this, we will make a lot of people, uh, they can swim and they will never, we will see, never see anyone will drown in the future. Uh, this is, that's what I, I think, actually. Awesome. Thank you so much. And so my intent, okay, so can you hear me? Just make sure. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, how has the COVID changed the perception of swimming in your area? So whatever you're at right now. Okay, so in Cape Town, I am actually only opening my swim school on Tuesday, inshallah, the 1st of September. Um, there's been a bit of mixed emotions around swimming. Um, even though this, this, there hasn't been any proof that COVID can spread through water, but I think it's more the facility than anything else. Um, some of my clients have returned or will be coming back on the 1st of September. Some of my clients feel that they would prefer to wait till next year. Um, I mean, the choice is entirely the I can put as much safety measures as possible, but you know what? It's still how you feel at the end of the day and what you're comfortable with at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, so that, that's basically what's happening with COVID, um, within Cape Town at the moment. There are lots of swim schools that are open already. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm opening in, at the December, inshallah, and I'm hoping that it will go well, it will, it'll be, and everything will work out. Inshallah. And so what about uh, Nepal and Egypt? How has COVID changed the perception of swimming? Um, since the COVID uh, just came, every swimming pool is just closed and uh, we couldn't swim and, uh, for like six months. Um, and we, we are um, just getting back uh, like uh, for, uh, for three weeks. We just uh, began to uh, to swim again, uh, so uh, but not like uh, like uh, the old times. Uh, right now we are um, we supposed to be just uh, 
four or uh, or five in uh, in one lane. Uh, in the past, we you can uh, a lot you can swim like uh, ten uh, swimmers in the lane, but right now we're just four in lane or five. Um, and this is a lot of um, a lot of people. They are afraid of uh, COVID and uh, and. A lot of swimmers, they don't want to come to swim again right now because they are very, really, very afraid. So uh, it's a lot, of, um, a, lot of, a lot of things that we are really, uh, very afraid to, because there, there are a lot of swimmers, they want to, to come and swim again. Yeah. So this is uh, really, um, something is very, very bad. Yeah, and so like for me, I was, I was gonna say something about um, like, I went to the pool two days ago and someone told me how like swimming is actually one of the sports that is going to be is doing a lot better than like other human contact like baseball or basketball what have you because yeah. the spread of the COVID in the water is less likely than like in the air so I feel like COVID has changed that perception of swimming in the like in my area at least um but I think inshallah like if we continue talking about it we can at least have the dry land aspect and the fear um, out of it as well. So we have one more slide where we were accidentally on it. So if you have any questions, you can follow me at Bifit for Akhira. You can also join my Facebook community. Um, and then Nadira, you can, uh, where should we follow you? Your Instagram handle. Um, Instagram preferably. You can check out my website on www.frretailers.com um, or you can check me out on, on, on Facebook. I'm not as active on, on Facebook as I am on Instagram. So it's a lot easier to follow me on Instagram. <laughs> All right. What about Nepal? Your Instagram handle is? Um, it's very easy to, to uh, follow me on Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is the Nepal Mizbah, um, and I can contact with everyone on Instagram actually, but I'm not uh, because of Facebook. <laughs> awesome. Are there any final words of advice and open um, discussion on our speakers? So we will check the chat. If you have any questions, let me know. But any final words of advice um, from you, the dear and Nepal? Nadira? Can you hear me, Nadira? Oh, she's muted. Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. My internet is a bit unstable. Sorry, what, what did you say? So any final words of advice and open discussion? Um, so I'd like to just say that it's really important for everyone to learn how to swim. Um, I know in Cape Town specifically, I've got a lot of moms who bring their kids to learn to swim but the mom and dad can't swim so it makes things a bit difficult because during the period of the swimming lessons when the child can't swim the parents can't really help the child if all forbid anything happens um i know swimming lessons are super expensive in cape town um but i mean even if you if you do a couple of sessions if you just kind of learn the water safety um, aspect, I think that's, that's really great. And that's my, my last final words. <laughs> Thank you. What about Nepal? Any final advice? Uh, my advice is just, I, uh, I hope that everyone just love to swim and, uh, and never be afraid of uh, water or uh, afraid of the swim or um, to do something new. Uh, we have to do a lot of things. We have to enjoy our life. We have to be relaxed. Uh, and uh, relax, it means bubbles. <laughs> if, if you're a swimmer, you will know what I mean. <laughs> bubbles, relax and bubbles. <laughs> That's it. You have to bubble, you have to swim, you have to take a deep breath and just let it go and just enjoy your life. <laughs> yes. And we have a question here from Gina. Great questions coming up. Well, number one, we do have two giveaways. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, come over to Instagram. I'm having giveaways right now that are ending on September 2nd, inshallah. They are more USA, Canada. We have a few international as well. The question here is, 
for you, Nadira. Um, I was wondering how, how you marketed your business. Are there a lot of Muslims living in Cape Town? It seems so targeted with the personal swimming lessons that are private. I thought that was so interesting. Thank you. Um, okay, so with regards to marketing my business, as I said, I started off with um, handing... Uh-oh. Nadira froze. Hello. You froze. Yeah. Can you repeat that again? <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, with regards to marketing in um, Cape Town, I didn't actually just market to Muslim people. Of marketing. Um, I don't only teach Muslim women, but I suppose the way that I do my swimming lessons caters She's frozen right on your end, Nepal. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, uh, can you... Nadira, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, no. Okay. We'll come back to her, I promise. But Nepal, um, Gina says I'm part of Egyptian as well, so it was nice to hear from you talk. Uh, you talk about Egypt. What do you think is the best thing about being a swim instructor in Egypt? Um, best thing? No, I couldn't. Yeah, so the question is, what do you think is the best thing about being a swim instructor in Egypt? Um, the best thing, uh, I think, um, actually, I think that the best thing that, um, I don't know, but there's a lot of things, actually, I, um, uh, to teach, uh, people and, uh, I don't know, actually, this is a lot of things, but, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Pick one thing. If you can pick one thing, what is it that you think? Okay, I think um, uh, what you. So what? Uh, what do you think is the best thing about being a s instructor in Egypt? Uh, the empowerment, for instance. Uh, to make uh, people just um, to just give me to give them hope and uh, I don't know. I don't okay. know, I it's okay. That's a good deep question. Perhaps they can like think about um, after this, inshallah. Nadira, can you hear me? I'm gonna unmute you for a second. Um, you were saying really I was I was mute. I was I lost the connection there, but so I'm not sure if you heard what I said. Not really. Um, but I might need to repeat it. Okay. So the, what was the question again? So she said it's a really good question about marketing. Uh, are there a lot of Muslims living in Cape Town? It seems so targeted to the personal lessons that are private. I thought that was so interesting. So, yeah, how do you market your business? Okay, so as I said, the initial marketing was, this was in 2011, I went to the local park down the road from our home and I handed out flyers. Um, my classes are not only for Muslims. Um, I've got lots of non-Muslims that I teach as well. But I suppose the way that I, I, I do my classes, so for example, and the main thing I think that attracts the, the Muslim clients to me is that I separate my classes. So when, for example, even my baby classes, um, I've got moms and tots classes, but the dads aren't allowed in the pool at the time. So there's no dads in the facility because the majority of the moms that come to me are very, very, um, I mean, they, they, they wear hijab or they wear niqab, um, and, and they don't feel comfortable with men in the facility. So um, in that way, I suppose, yes, um, I do cater a lot more for the Muslim people, and I suppose they're a lot more comfortable in my facility. Um, but I, I, I don't only cater for Muslim people. I mean, I've got lots of non-Muslim clients as well. Awesome. Thank you. And so the last question is for me. Uh, what, do you be, what do I believe we can do as Muslims to help make Muslim ladies around the world comfortable and motivated to swim. I think personally doing some sort of like dry land workouts, why are you wearing your favorite burkini, bikini, whatever you wear to the pool <laughs> and actually do the workout on land? 
Um, that's why I did some videos like wearing Lyra swimsuit and did some exercises because I know a lot of ladies purchase like, you know, whatever brand that you purchase from, but they don't really use the swimwear appropriately in the water. And so I think for me, it's to change the perception starting from social media and then like, you know, showing more drills, more skills. And Nepal has a really amazing like videos of her teaching women swimming um, in Burkini, which, you know, in modern swimwear, which inspired me. So I'm like, you know, you can check her Instagram. But that question is Gina asked because she knows how much passion I am about changing the perception of like women on social media. Like, let's start from there, I think, perhaps. And then also kind of um, be our, like, you know, we are all talking about it. So continue this conversation after the campaign is over. And yeah. I think I hope that answered your question. Um, our audience, thank you so much for attending. We're about to wrap up, but are there any other questions? Anything else? No? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, uh, Nadira. Oh, Yasmin. Yes, yes, yes. How, okay. So Yasmin is asking for everyone, how was your experience with Instagram? Oh, I have a lot to say, but I will not start <laughs> right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, raising awareness about your cause yeah okay so I guess that's for me right now to answer I have like a love hate relationship with social media especially with Instagram <laughs> I'm not sure if you've been well, uh, following my, my like Facebook and stuff but for <laughs> me personally I'm kind of a little bit frustrated from it because like I don't have the perfect feed or what have you and so it's really really depressing at times it has played a huge role in my mental like you know self-esteem like why don't I have that many followers what's wrong with my feed I'm trying everything the hashtags all of it so I really have a love-hate relationship with it it hasn't been a happy experience yes me at all to be honest um which is why I kind of like ended up you know trying to go on YouTube LinkedIn and that like who is my ideal client essentially like, you know business talk right now like who's who i want to target and not all of them are on instagram so i'm trying to now um you know think strategically okay perhaps instagram isn't the only place and i shouldn't let it get into me um but it hasn't been a happy experience to be very very <laughs> honest with you <laughs> so on that note ola i think i've i've read done my Instagram like five times already as in I, I added pictures, I removed pictures, I added pictures again, then I removed them again. <laughs> I started <laughs> to put them in like a proper order so you'll see my new Instagram feed looks a bit more better. Um, but yeah, in, it's, it's a bit hectic, eh? Social media is a bit hectic. Like sometimes you are coaching, swimming, you've got your own life, you've got your own family life and to manage Instagram is quite hectic. <laughs> it's on <laughs> Nepal what about you that's why I hate uh, Instagram <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> but my problem that I, I really I just I wanted to uh, focus about uh, what my work and about what I do actually and when I just see oh my god I, I supposed to, to post the story oh my god and then uh, I just forgot that I supposed to post <laughs> And then I just uh, run away to, to take my phone and I'm supposed to take a picture or I'm supposed to, to take a story and then I'm supposed to post it. Oh my gosh, I just forgot. I forgot it. <laughs> I feel like, oh my, I had a headache. Why did I just do something like that? <laughs> Why am I doing something? I want to I just, everyone, hey, everyone, can you see me without internet? <laughs> 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 That's what I wish, actually. But I, but I must say, I must say that Instagram connected us. So yes, so know. let's talk but. about. It. <laughs> so we share the negativity. Let's talk about the positive side of it. Um, yeah. So I started this page my in 2014. Like someone started for me, my friend, and so I don't have like 10k follows. And it's been like almost 60. I don't have that 10k follows yet. So there's like there's that. Um, but I think. Like what Nadira said, like I connect with a lot of amazing people and at the same time, like having a system is important, you know, like marketing 101, having themes perhaps, um, like make it enjoyable for yourself and don't get hung up on like the numbers, the, uh, 
and not a part of it. Think of it business wise. Um, and like, if you're a blogger, for instance, you know, you can like blog, share your feelings, what have you. But like, if, yeah, so like there's two ways. Personal, I have a personal account and I have the uh, business account. They're both business, but I'm trying to keep the personal one, like, you know, for me to self-reflect, what have you, talk about topics that are not fitness related. And then the Beefy for Acad account, um, trial and error. That's it, trial and error. Um, and like, look at the positive side. Like, who are you connecting and dear Nepal, if it wasn't for Instagram, it would have been happy. <laughs> so there's a positive side of that. And yeah. Are there any other questions about it? Or about like anything? I think I should be good. So you're welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm so happy to see all of you and to see you here as well. So we will have a replay here. We have one more webinar, webinar tomorrow, inshallah, with two different triathletes, um, Khadija and Jerry. Make sure you can come, inshallah, and watch the replays. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for tuning in. If you've enjoyed this episode, make sure to subscribe today and leave a five star review. You can also screenshot and share this episode with a family or a friend. Be strong, be fit. Be fit for Akira. <laughs>